So I want to talk to you about the sexiest topic in modern economics, parking. <laughs> and like many other sexy topics, parking is often really a big headache. Sometimes it gets congested, and other times you have to pay, even though the streets are underused. When it gets congested, you can waste a lot of time and fuel, as well as slowing other drivers down, and even polluting the city. Yet no one likes to pay anything for parking, let alone paying a lot to park in underused streets where there are plenty of vacant spaces. But pricing seems to be the best way of achieving the ideal state in which everyone can easily find a space, many shoppers can come and get to the shops, and yet no one is overpaying. And today, a few cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles are taking the lead in achieving that ideal state by installing sensors in the streets and networking them with mobile applications so that they can advise citizens on where to park. And they're also networking them with demand-based pricing, which is all about finding the price that gives you the best trade-off between congestion and underuse. Now, two years ago, I never dreamed of helping to solve the world's parking problems. No, 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 no. In fact, that was something I used to dream of when I was five years old, and my mum used to drag me through the streets of London with huge bags of shopping, so we didn't have to pay for parking. <laughs> I only got into parking um, because the company I work for, which is better known for um, printing and copying, um, had um, <laughs> uh, just acquired another company which, uh, whose businesses include the management of many different cities' uh, transport infrastructures. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to say that parking is not just a headache for drivers, but it can also quickly become a political hot potato that nobody wants to touch. You really need to have data to be able to show that one, city, one street really is more congested than another street nearby and so it deserves to have a higher price. But ignoring these parking problems isn't going to make them go away. But rather, they're going to get a lot worse. So, as we've heard twice today already, um, it's the first time in history that more of, uh, than half of the world's population lives in cities. And the urban population is expected to continue to grow a lot over the next 20 years. At the same time, the number of vehicles in the world is forecast to grow from 1 billion to 2 billion. Yet, many cities are actually starting reducing the amount of parking space because they believe that the citizens will be happier with more green space and pedestrians. So, better parking pricing is becoming increasingly necessary. Now, as I was saying earlier on, my company had just acquired another company which deals with many other, uh, many cities' transport infrastructures. Now, one of those cities, Los Angeles, was keen to install 7,000 sensors in its streets just for parking, as part of the LA Express Park project. Now, as you can see from this map, the project covers all of downtown LA. And since June 2012, we've been managing 3,000 different parking prices in the city of Los Angeles. Now, Los Angeles is a particularly interesting city to work with because according to many studies, it's the most congested city in the USA. And it's particularly interesting to me because my role in this project has been to analyze all the data. Now, these days, cities are considering a vast array of new technologies for helping to make parking easier. New meters can accept credit card payments, and they can even accept mobile phone payments, so you no longer have to fumble around in your pocket to see if you have the right change. They can even send you SMS reminders, so now, you have no excuse for getting a parking fine when you forget, return, forget to return to top up the meter. Well, almost no excuse. There is a rumour that some judges will believe you when you tell them your mobile phone was out of batteries. <laughs> and of course they've been lining their streets with these occupancy sensors and it's only become viable to do that in the last decade. And this is mainly because of the reductions in cost and power consumption of wireless mesh networks, and there are surprisingly many interesting things you can do with such sensors. First, you can network them with mobile applications, so you can guide citizens to a cheaper space nearby. You can also combine the sensor data with payment data from the meters to spot all the parking violations. That's called directed enforcement. 
And if too many spaces are typically full, you can raise the prices. And if too many are empty, you can lower prices. That's called demand-based pricing. And finally, if midday is typically busier than the morning, then you can set different prices for those different times of day, which is called time of day pricing. Now, an economist of legendary stature called William Vickery first proposed demand-based pricing for parking in the 1950s. Yet, San Francisco only started using demand-based pricing in 2011 and LA in 2012. So right now, the really important question is, does it work in practice? So to answer those questions, let's have a look at how we've changed LA's prices and what's improved or, of course, otherwise. So back in June 2012, before we started the project, about half of LA's spaces were at $1 an hour, 30% at $3 an hour. And since then, we've made price changes every two months. If we look at the places which started at $3 or $4 an hour, we'll see that many of them stayed at the same price or saw an increase. Relatively few of them went down. But if we look at the places that started at $1 or $2 an hour, we'll see that the biggest changes that we've made have been to reduce the price in about 50% of the spaces in LA. Now, many people suppose that such pricing projects are about making parking more expensive so the cities can increase their revenue. But these price decreases show that they really are about finding the best trade-off between congestion and underuse. So, does it work? Well, to answer that question, we need to first define a performance measure. We could try to say that the system is in an ideal state if between 70 and 90% of the spaces on the street are full. But, some streets only have three spaces, so they can never be 70 to 90% full. So instead, what we do is we look at the 20 nearest spaces to any given space, and if zero or one of those spaces are free, we say it's congested, and if seven or more are vacant, we're going to say that it's uh, underused. So, does it reduce congestion? Well, here's a plot of the number of congested places in the city at different times of day. Now, early in the day, uh, there are less people parked downtown, so there's less congestion. But as we go from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., the congestion actually triples. Now let's do a little calculation. Um, in the busiest five hours of the day, this blue line shows that there are an average of about a thousand congested spaces in the city. Now with at most one vacancy out of every 20 spaces, it turns out that each of the drivers looking for parking has to slowly circle around looking for a space for at least 100 meters, very often more than that. But with two arrivals every hour for every space, that means that drivers are slowly circling around looking for parking for over a thousand kilometers per day. That's, that's a lot because they're driving quite slowly at that time. Now, let's look at the same plot after our price changes. The number of congested spaces is down by 10%. Now, that's a good start. Um, it's a particularly good start when you consider that reducing congestion means that lots of people must change their behavior. It's not just the people who come to the congested spaces and either try and succeed or fail to find a parking space today. It's also the people who usually avoid the congested spaces but will start coming back as soon as they realize that the congestion has gone down. So, what about underuse? Well, there were surprisingly many places in the city that were underused, and we, in those places we've reduced the prices, and this has led to a 5% reduction so far in the rate of underuse. That's less impressive at first sight than a 10% reduction in congestion. Um, but one of the reasons for this is because um, we get a relatively small effect since uh, many of the places that are underused, in fact so underused, you need to double the demand in order to bring them up to our ideal state of um, between two and six vacancies out of every 20 spaces. Nevertheless, we've seen a 10% increase in the average occupancy in such underused places. So, what you'll notice is that so far we've only made very simple changes every two months. Even though we've got new data every few seconds, 
And we have algorithms that can work much faster than that. And as data analysts, we usually like to make use of all the available data about traffic flow and about the purpose of people's trips in order to make more sophisticated changes. However, we're not doing this to show that we're smart. We're doing this to make it better for people in the city. In particular, we want to make sure that drivers have time to internalize the rates and to change their behavior if they wish. And there are many ways in which drivers can change their behavior. They could change the duration, the frequency, or the timing of their visits. They could start ride-sharing or cycling. Or they could park in a cheaper space just around the corner and walk. Well, wouldn't it be nice if there was always a cheaper space just around the corner? Here's a map of a small part of the city with the current prices. And you can see that, indeed, half of the streets do indeed have a cheaper space nearby. And that the prices vary from $1.50 to $5 between immediately adjacent streets. Now, uh, when looking at this map, more than one of my American friends has remarked that they'd rather park directly in front of the gym, yes, the place they go to exercise, than to save a dollar by walking around the corner. You'll see also that we have different prices on different sides of the same street. This is because we often see very different demand patterns on different sides of the same street. Why is that? Well, in a city like Los Angeles, where U-turns are often not allowed, it's actually, you can end up driving a long way to get from one side of the street to the other. Now, in this map that I showed you earlier on, you can end up driving even further because there's a one-way system there. Now, to make thoroughly scientific conclusions from the results that I just showed, you need to really analyze over a year of data so that you can distinguish seasonal effects from pricing effects. But nevertheless, what we're seeing is small changes that are in the right direction. So, so far it seems demand-based pricing is a success. But what about the future of parking technology? Well, rather than installing sensors in the streets, maybe you could attach them to the sides of a city's taxis or even their self-driving cars. And then as the taxis drive around the city, they could map the occupancy. Or maybe you could just use cameras for measuring the occupancy. That would be particularly useful in places like beside railway lines where there can be too much electromagnetic activity for in-street sensors. And while there are many mobile applications for parking today, there's still a lot of work to be done on navigation systems. So, for instance, there isn't a system today which can guide you as you drive to the nearby spot that you would prefer. And even with the best pricing in the world, parking will still be something of a lottery. You'll never be 100% sure to get the exact space that you want. But if you could reserve your space in advance, then parking would be a lot more predictable. But such reservation systems for on-street parking will have to overcome a number of challenges. Firstly, they would have to operate in a mixed initiative environment where some people reserve and other people come and go just as they please, just like today. Second, due to variations in traffic conditions and other uncertainties, uh, you may not know exactly what time you want to reserve for. And finally, we must keep the effort of reserving your parking very, very low. After all, reserving your parking shouldn't be at all as important as reserving your ticket for the next TEDx event. <laughs> okay, so maybe in future, your self-driving car will make your reservations for you while taking into account the pricing conditions at the time. Talking of the pricing conditions at the time, in the near future in LA, we're going to start to experiment with varying the prices in real time. The goal is to handle situations where you get unusual congestion. Now, you might try to handle unusual congestion by using special prices for special events. But what happens if several special events interfere with each other? Say, for instance, that there's a major basketball match at just the time people are rushing to finish their Christmas shopping. Well, such situations may be quite difficult to predict a day in advance, but they can be relatively easy to predict about 20 minutes in advance. And so it's exactly that sort of situation that we believe that real-time pricing can help, provided there is an adequate infrastructure for communicating the price changes to drivers. And as well as making pricing more dynamic, we've also been working on making it more contextual. Well, what do I mean by that? What I mean 
is to make prices that better match to the actual utility of the streets to drivers. So one example of a contextual model is that if we're talking about congestion, we shouldn't be just really looking at how many cars are parked, we should be looking at information about traffic flow. For instance, on interstates or motorways or autobuses, it's usually not allowed to park. And after all, even if such parking wouldn't be terribly, terribly dangerous, it would surely cause a lot of people to slow down and speed up. So perhaps in busier parts of the city, parking occupancy targets ought to be lower, and in quieter places, they could be higher. Another example of a contextual model is that we shouldn't just be looking at how many cars are parked, but we should also be weighting that by information about how many people are arriving. Just because a street is 95% full, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is unhealthy congestion. It could be that it's the middle of the night and uh, no one is arriving, and so no one is having trouble finding a space. And finally, <clears throat> um, if we're talking about congestion, one of the main reasons for reducing congestion is in order to cut pollution. Now, ideally, we would then be able to draw a direct link between parking policy and people's health. And of course, doing that in practice is by no means an easy matter. But we do have a project ongoing at the moment with the University of California at Berkeley who are coupling information from ground-based pollution sensors with satellite images to directly explore that link. So, finally, I wanted to point out that it's important to get such utility models right because as the cost of in-street sensors and wireless mesh networks continues to decrease, Demand-based pricing for parking may be coming to a city near you soon. Thank you.